on, bud. There's a whole other world of dragons out there. Unbelievable. What do you say? What should we name it? Itchy armpit it is. I was very worried about it. In fact, uh, that's what kept us honest along the way. So nobody wanted to make yet another disappointing sequel. And uh, the, the, the peril is, is very obvious because it's so easy to retread material and not do it quite as well without that sense of discovery that the first film has. Mm. But uh, by picking up five years later where Hiccup's at a different juncture in his life and now he's stepping into adulthood with trepidation and kind of looking back at the freedom of his youth and still not feeling quite sure as to who he is and certainly not a carbon copy of his father. It made for a different story and equally universal, but it allowed us to tread new new territory with the story. Very much so. I was a, I was a Star Wars kid, so um, I loved Star Wars. And then when The Empire Strikes Back came along, which is one of the few great sequels, mm. I I was blown away. I mean, I, it felt like it it redefined that universe for me, and it took everything that I loved about the first film mm. and made it bigger and more grand and the scope increased, the, the sense of the stakes increased, the mm -hmm. characters got richer, the, the humor was funnier, like everything about it was just uh, dialed up. And so we, we kind of set that as the high bar, you know, the thing to aspire to tonally. Mm -hmm. And um, along the way, we just tried to, to keep that same balance of elements mm -hmm. within our world. Well, designing dragons is the most fun part of the job. <laughs> we just sit around with sheets of paper and pencils and come up with different designs that push the idea of what a dragon is. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some pretty unique ones, really interesting ones in this one. But we were building upon an idea that was set up in the first film, which is mm -hmm. there, is an, there is a hierarchy mm -hmm. of dragons. And, and the lower rung dragons serve the higher rung dragons. And we got to see that at the end of the first film, where the, the queen of that particular nest yeah. died. But you got to see how sort of... Uh, tyrannical it was. And in this case, we, we introduced that there are several rungs above that to the ultimate king of dragons, mm -hmm. which is a title held by uh, a species that is, that is uh, well fit for that position, which is called the Bewilderbeast. It just so happens that there are several of them and they can challenge each other for the role. Well, it's two things. On, on one side, we had, uh, we were the, the, the first film to debut a whole new generation of software at the studio which increased the power behind what we do um, immensely so that we don't, we don't have to wait for renders in the same way that we used to. Animators can adjust the characters and the expressions and work with much more complex models mm -hmm. to achieve much more subtle and finessed acting uh, without it having, without crashing the system or having it to wait. Not only that, they can, they can pair them up with many, many characters within the same shot. So whereas before it wouldn't have been possible to have battle sequences like we have in this film where there are thousands of soldiers mm -hmm. and hundreds of dragons and all sorts of special effects going off, now we're able to do that. Um, and when you have that kind of visual potential, bringing in an esteemed cinematographer like Roger Deakins really ups the game because he approaches it as though it's a virtual set. Mm -hmm. he, he deals in live action terms and he has such incredible taste and sophistication. And he relies heavily upon natural light. So there is there is a sense of this very believable, kind of gritty, real, naturalistic approach to the lighting of the film, which defies the, the medium in a way. It's, it's, very, it's very unlike most animated films. It doesn't have a cartoony quality, even though it does have caricature. It's extremely liberating because it means, um, aside from the time that you have to make the film and the budget that you have to really explore those, uh, those, those visual details, there's nothing that holds us back anymore. I mean, if we can imagine it, we can create it, and, and it can look very convincing. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a dangerous idea to have. <laughs> <laughs> you can dream as big and create as big as you want, and you're really only held back by your, your capacity to pull it off. John Powell recorded our first score, and it's, it's one of the, the, the more beloved scores out there. He's been really celebrated for it, and he, he earned himself an Academy mm -hmm. Award nomination. And, uh, so he was tasked with the same daunting um, assignment, which was how do you, how do you outdo yourself? You know, how do you approach this and not create uh, a disappointing follow-up? 
but he was able to pull it off in, in such a magical way. And I'm not musical, but I love music. And, and it, to me, it's just, it, it's amazing because it bypasses the brain and goes straight to the heart. And I rely upon the composer and, and uh, John, such a, an amazing example of that, to be a storyteller and to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So things that we don't cover in dialogue or things that um, would be too cumbersome to try to narratively explore uh, in other ways, music can, t can just sort of lift you there, can take you right to the emotional place. And I think John has done it time and again in this score. Mm. I think it's my favorite of his so far. I think he did outdo him himself and uh, it's remarkable. Every dragon has its secrets. I'll show them all to you. Did you know about this? That's your mother? Now you know where I get my dramatic flair. <laughs> he likes you.